Attendants help the participant put on a harness and support him with ropes and pulleys. We attach eight sensors on the participant to track body movement. The swimmer wears a head-mounted display to explore the virtual environment. The swimmer sees his avatar in the virtual ocean from multiple perspectives. He feels like swimming at the surface of the ocean. Our virtual environment contains dynamic elements. The swimmer can swim at various times of the day. Interactive splashdowns are synchronized as he swims.
with respect to the, the technologies and the science that we're looking at and where the, the future directions to explore and to push the boundaries of some of these systems. So, um, so one of the directions that we're going in the lab is, um, is 3D, 3D experiences, uh, but we're not a big fan of the stereoscopic 3D worlds. Rather, we're much more interested in um, perspective changing 3D. So for that, I'll show you a couple of the slides, um, two, two types of displays that we made that really track the person's eyes or head, basically where their head is, and the screen, and make sure that whatever you project on the screen is in the right perspective. So if you move relative to the screen, or your verbal sounds, uh, like uh-huh, mm-hmm, yeah, um, and be expressive. And that was not part of the original plan. So, um, Feeding on that a little bit, we tried to develop this into a singing uh, interface um, because it really was like a musical instrument. So we did some um, investigation of the, of the singing interface. Just so you know what's going on here, there is a cyber glove that's measuring the fingers of the, uh, the speaker or performer. Uh, there's a tracking device that tracks where they are in space. Uh, there's a glove on the left hand that are like uh, effectively buttons. And then that goes through the computer that does the mapping. And in this case, it, it converts it to performance. So that's frequency and amplitudes of sound. And if you shape it right, and there's a mapping in there that does that, a little neural network that does that, um, with practice, you can start to speak with that thing because you can get the amplitude and the, and the frequencies to look like this voice. Five minutes. Uh-oh, all right, well, all right, we're gonna have to run here then. Okay, so, made it wearable. The sound, well, this is what it sounds like. So she would sing with her voice and the glove at the same time. There are a few pieces composed for it. still sounds um, fairly robotic. And if you play the right frequencies and amplitudes through that synthesizer, it sounds like a recording. It sounds totally natural. Um, when you do it through this mapping, which is trained on text to speech, it still sounds pretty robotic. So that led to, well, how are we going to improve that? How can we make it so we really can sing with our hands? And so uh, that led us down the pathway of creating an articulatory speech synthesizer, not frequency and amplitudes, but muscles and bones and activations and aerodynamics and aeroacoustics. So we're, we've been heading down that pathway for some time, and we built a dual kit called Artisan that allows you to model soft tissue and, and rigid bodies. Um, from that, we can put it together to model the human anatomy and its function. And then, uh, then we can start to model the function, like in this case, speech. Um, here, uh, we can do chewing and swallowing, breathing as well. They they all go together. Um, so we've been exploring that and uh, and putting a lot of effort into that. So the way it works is you, it's like a tinker toy. You put the pieces together. You specify the muscle activations, and the toolkit does the forward simulation to make sure that the muscles and the you know, bones all work together. This is just a little simplified thing. And from that, um, these are just some of the features that are inside there that are necessary to get um, the articulatory speech synthesis going. Um, so from that, we've been uh, building up the uh, human anatomical models along with their functions. So we're right at the point um, where we have uh, um, most of the upper airway uh, model. Uh, along with some of the, uh, the rest of the body. So we do uh, dissections of uh, cadavers to get the muscle fiber directions. Uh, we do a lot of MRI and CT scanning to get the bones and um, 
and the way the attachments work and get the functional, like the movements, dynamics, and uh, create these different models. So these are some of the models that we create. This is from the visible human data set. And then we get functional models. And there's the uh, larynx and the uh, hyoid moving around. These are all muscle activated physics based models. And here's uh, for, for speech is where you're starting to get tongue movements. So that's the top tissue muscle activated tongue inside the jaw. Uh, and then these things have to collide. So the tongue pushes up against the palate, say like an L or an R. Uh, oh, yeah. I just read this in there because we're also working on a robot head. Um, again, it's part of our to drive this expressive And the, the facial expression is also part of speech. So that plays a role. materializa as nossas narrativas, os nossos objetivos. A questão é, quando você fala da, da possibilidade de produção de conteúdo, né, ele está aqui pensando na, na, no outro aspecto dessa produção, e no mundo onde as leis de direitos autorais praticamente estão impedindo novos processos criativos porque está tudo na mão das grandes corporações. Né? Quando você fala de sistemas de câmeras né, que são capazes de não só mapear a gente por fora, mas por dentro, né? a questão que eu gostaria de deixar clara, uma outra questão também recentemente, é, as, a operação das, das mesas de, 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 de mercado de ações, estão é, passando a ser controladas por software, com preocupações imensas sobre como esses softwares podem, é, de alguma maneira, influenciar o próprio mercado de ações. Onde vai ficar a nossa reflexão sobre as questões éticas e essas maravilhas tecnológicas, aparentemente maravilhosas, podem ser completamente desastrosas, dependendo de como a gente vai levar isso, no seu instituto, na sua pesquisa. Esse é um aspecto que tem sido considerado. subverted 
that people can take it and make it their own and do what they want with it to, to go against whatever the problem is. If they want to set up a thing that has a little underground economy using whatever technical solution, okay, they should be allowed to do that. And that's made completely illegal. But that's part of what makes the technology uh, solve the more complex issue of ethics and control. Um, and so that, yeah, you, you can use it for whatever you want. And it's not a solution. That's what I think. We're not solving your problem. As long as, as soon as we use the center design to make it so you adapt it easier, adopt the technology easier, we are controlled. As long as you make it so no, you can appropriate it for something you want to do with it. Then all of a sudden the tables turn. But that's not how design is done right now. Microsoft Word, it's complicated things like Excel. You can appropriate. You can write video games in Excel. You can do all sorts of stuff with it. But Microsoft Word, no. It's pretty much this is how documents are written. And if you go into other technologies, mm -hmm. and the bank trading stuff is a good example of this, um, we don't have the capability to circumvent that and make our own little mini economy, for example, like a Bitcoin or So that's an example of where you can appropriate. And it's those mechanisms that we should be designing in this. And that's how.